Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sal Gilberto from Awareness. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, today's webinar is entitled Lessons Learned in Igniting Word of Mouth Movement. Um, you will be hearing from Robin Phillips. I have Robin on the line. Uh, Robin, if you can hear me, say hello. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> um, she will be discussing um, She will be discussing her book, Brains on Fire, uh, Igniting Powerful, Sustainable Word of Mouth Movement. Um, we will go through a couple of logistics. Uh, logistical items, um, and then go ahead and get started with the presentation. So let's just start with who you're going to hear from. As I mentioned, um, you'll be hearing from Robin Phillips, um, and she is the courageous president of Brains on Fire. So Brains on Fire is a company um, that is a thought leader in word of mouth movements and is best known for igniting powerful, sustainable word of mouth movements. You'll also be hearing from me. Uh, this is, my name is Sal Gilberto. I'm a marketing manager here at Awareness Inc. Uh, you can get in contact with me at um, my Twitter handle is S. Gilberto, um, or you can do the, uh, the Awareness Inc. Twitter handle of um, at sign Awareness Inc. And as we go through the presentation, um, you'll be able to submit questions. Uh, we prefer that you submit questions, if at all possible, through Twitter. Please use the, uh, the Twitter hashtag pound awareness tank. We will try to get through as many of those questions during the presentation and immediately after the presentation as we can. Um, if you, uh, you can also submit your questions via the WebEx chat um, feature on the right of your screen. Um, we will be monitoring that as well. Um, we will be stopping at the end of the presentation for questions. So um, you know, we will be selecting a few questions to answer on the air at the end. If you have technical issues, if you can't hear, if you're, you know, if, if the resolution is, is slow or if the, the audio is muffled, we do have WebEx support. Um, we have WebEx support on the line. They will answer your questions if you submit them via the WebEx chat. Um, Robin and I are not WebEx experts. We are, we're here to present the marketing, and if you have WebEx questions, we do have WebEx on the line to assist you. I will go ahead and mention as well that um, if you do miss any of this presentation, if you drop off or if you have to go to another meeting or something, um, we are doing a recording, um, so you will have access to uh, you know, a video file or everything we do today. So I um, also want to talk about uh, our book giveaway. So um, as I mentioned, Robin is the author of Brains on Fire, a many powerful, sustainable word of mouth movement, and we will be giving away, um, giving away a few copies of her book. Um, I've, I posted the link to purchase her book on Amazon, and we'll be giving away five copies of the book today. Uh, to those people who submit their questions via Twitter, we'll pick up some good questions, and um, we'll have a book giveaway. So before we get started um, with Robin's presentation, I really quickly want to go over who Awareness is. A lot of you uh, have attended um, Awareness webinars before, and you know who we are, but many of you have not. So uh, really simply, um, Awareness is a company that makes uh, software for marketers. Um, specifically, our flagship product is, a, uh, is uh, it's called The Hub and it's a social media software solution. Uh, it allows you to publish, manage, measure, and engage across social channels. Uh, Awareness as a company, um, we work with some of the biggest brands in the world, as you can see by the customer listing uh, on the lower left of your screen right now, um, and we've partnered with some of the largest agencies in the world, as you can tell by the, the graphic on the, on the lower right. And we've been around for 10 years. And um, being around for 10 years, making software for marketers, we hear a lot of challenges. Um, we talk to a lot of companies uh, of all sizes, and we hear a couple of you know, common themes that have come up as far as social media challenges. So one thing that we hear um, a lot of marketers say is that they're overwhelmed by their social media efforts. Many people um, that we talk to, social media is a percentage of their job rather than, rather than their entire job, and they kind of feel like it's not proportional the amount of time that they put into it isn't proportional to sort of um, its priority. They feel like it takes a lot of time for them to publish to multiple channels, to comment uh, back to people who've commented to them, answer questions, things like that. We also hear a lot of people say that they're having problems proving the value. Um, they know that social media has value. They're having trouble quantifying it. They're having trouble getting you know, their colleagues and superiors to buy into social media to perhaps get more budget or um, if, you know, just buy in in general um, because they're having trouble, have, having trouble showing the value. They also, um, they also say that they're losing control. 
that they have uh, perhaps a team of people that are posting to different channels. Perhaps they have, uh, you know, interns that are, that are helping them out. They have a lot of channels. They have a lot of passwords. They have people writing into them, and they don't know who's commented back. They don't know what tasks have been taken care of. They don't have sort of defined, um, defined roles for each person, and they just feel like they're losing control. So when you, um, when you feel overwhelmed, and you're having trouble proving the value, and you don't feel like you have control of a marketing initiative, it's really difficult to get strategic. It's difficult for these companies to say, here are my Q1 goals for social media, here are our processes, here, here are even our tactics for social media. So, having heard these challenges, we went ahead and we created the Awareness Social Marketing Hub. And as I mentioned, it allows you to publish, manage, measure, and engage across social channels. Um, it allows you to do this across the most important social channels. Twitter, Facebook, WordPress, Foursquare, Flickr, YouTube. We just added SlideShare. So really, you know, the main places where, um, where marketers want to post their content, we've created a tool that allows them to do this. So what does the Awareness Social uh, Marketing Hub do? It allows you to publish across social channels. It allows you to take your message and and sort of morph it and twist it and uh, make it fit the proper social channels. Um, it allows you to do that quickly and easily. It allows you to manage your social media um, with permissioning and controls. So you can assign tasks to your team. You can uh, allow people to publish. Some people will not be allowed to publish without review. Really gain control of, you know, who's responsible for what and make sure that tasks actually get done. We allow you to measure. Um, in that we have an analytics package that allows you to get, you know, hard numbers on your social media. allows you to track your social media the same way you track your other marketing initiatives. It allows you to engage. It allows you to interact with your customer base and really, you know, fire them up, which is, you know, part of this, uh, part of this presentation that you're about to see. Um, and, you know, by allowing you to publish, manage, measure, and engage, you can gain control, you can centralize, you can evolve your social media from what you're doing now and take it to the next level, and you can measure success so that you know what works and you can improve upon the things that don't work. And um, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Robin in a second, um, just to let you know, though, if you're interested in finding out more information about how the Social Marketing Hub can help you with your social media efforts, we do have a demo coming up. Um, it's uh, March 3rd at 2 p.m. I'll be hosting it, and I can go into some more information about the social social marketing hub. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and, um, Robin, I'm going to give you control of the presentation. Great. Thank you, Sal. You're welcome. And okay. I see, I see I'm now the presenter. Is I hope everyone is seeing Lessons Learned Igniting Movements on their screen. Um, first of all, let me say hello. I'm really excited to be here with all of you today, and I appreciate you tuning in. I hope I'll make this fun and exciting for you. Um, First of all, let me just tell you the problem that I have with doing webinars. I love to do them, but... Hey, Robin, before you get started, I'm not seeing it. Um, have you uh, shared your desktop? Yes. So you can't see it? No, I'm still on my... Do we, do we need to call in... Okay. Go ahead and start your desktop with your, your desktop share, Robin. Okay, so now do I need to do something there? Remember, he, he needed to do that to move it to me? Um, no, you're already the presenter, so you just go ahead and click on the Quick Start tab and go to Share Your Desktop. Um, okay, hang on. Um, tell me where that is again. <laughs> In the upper left-hand corner, you should have a, a, a visual that says Share Desktop. Um, no, we didn't do that, so... Uh, I see a quick start info. Okay, click on the quick start. Okay. You should have an option to share your desktop. Yep. Go ahead and click on that. Got it. Is it sharing on your end? Because I don't see anything yet. There we go. There we go. Got it. Everybody good? Perfect. All right. Um, sorry about that. And I don't know why that keeps jumping back. Okay. So let's get started all over again. How about that? And I will start with hello again. <laughs> and one of the problems about webinars, including the technical difficulties you often face, 
um, is that, you know, I can't see you, but today we're going to pretend like I can see you and you can see me, and that will make it a lot more fun. So there I am saying hello, and I don't know why that's happening. Um, you can look for me down here occasionally. I'm just going to pop up and, and so that you'll be aware that there's a real person. Obviously, you can tell that from the technical difficulties, but there's a real person on the line, and you can look for me, and I'll, I'll continue to say hello. One of the things that I want to share about myself, just to let you know who I am, I was uh, actually born without a name and spent 11 days without a name, which I find fascinating that I actually ended up in the business of naming things. That's what I've done for years and years before Brains on Fire. When my parents finally settled on a name for me, they settled on this very simple name, and lucky for me, they added those two Bs, because if you Google Robin with one B, you will find a... Um, a professional dog trainer, and I'm not a professional dog trainer. Instead, I've had the luxury, the benefit of working on some awesome, courageous clients like Fiskars, Love 146, which I'll talk about today, as well as Best Buy, Charleston Parks Conservancy, Ray Airby Tools, Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, and Green Dot Public Schools. So it's just been a wide array of profit and not for profit. Just to let you know what I love and what I love to do, these are my two kids, and I love them beyond words. That's Tyler on the left, Logan on the right. I love hot yoga, cold beer, sunny days, and starry nights. And I absolutely, positively get up every single morning of my life with a single-minded focus to make positive change in the world. So today, it's true, we're going to talk about lessons that we, Brains on Fire as a team, have learned at Night in Movement. And we're so excited about this concept of Brains on Fire, and in fact, we believe Brains on Fire is indeed a movement itself, not a company, that we named a book after Brains on Fire. And um, that book... That book has 10 lessons learned, and today I only have the ability to share with you a couple of those lessons, but I've picked my favorite lessons for us to just kind of go through, but the book has 10 lessons, so today I'm sharing just a couple. One of the my favorite quotes in our new book is actually from Rob Morris of Love 146, and he says, we all want to see ourselves in a bigger story than just our own lives, and I really believe this is true. Especially in America, I think there, there's been a huge value shift. Um, I actually am one of the contributing writers for the Huffington Post and Small Business America section, and I had the, the good fortune of uh, listening to Ariana Huffington speak about a month ago, several months ago maybe, in New York, and she made this statement. She said that she had a friend that years and years ago, maybe 20 years ago, who said, you know, Ariana, there's two routes you can take in this world. You can follow your dream or you can go for security and get a corporate job and work yourself up the ladder. And you may not be doing exactly what you want to do, but you just the trade off is security. And he chose the secure route. And about, I guess, nine months ago, she ran up into him and he said to her um, that he was following his dream, that he had opened his own business and that he was really passionate about this. And she said, wow, what happened? I thought you took the, the secure road, and he said that after 2009, there, he, he had come to see so many people laid off and what they thought were very secure jobs, but he came to realize that there just is no such thing as security anymore and that we should all be following our dreams, and I think this is a huge opportunity for corporations to understand who they are, what they stand for, and connect through their shared passions with their customers. This is really critical. Okay, so today, um, if you talk about marketing, if you talk about anything to do with marketing, you cannot talk, avoid this subject, which is social media. It's the shiny new object in the room. But here's what we believe. We believe that when it comes to technology, what's exciting and shiny today is absolutely going to be different tomorrow. It's not dead. So this is my friend Chris Sandoval um, discussing that. He's actually from the USAA. We get a lot of people who come to Brains on Fire and they say, you know, we need to use our brand ambassadors so we can get some viral buzz and community influencers can evangelize the product seeding, blah, blah, blah. We'll tweet about it, Facebook, Foursquare, and I'm sorry, people. <laughs> but what is that about? You know, because business is not and should never be strictly about technology. It's about this and this. It always has been. It's about people. 
And I cannot say this enough. It is truly about people. So what I want to talk to you about just a little bit, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what is a movement. What exactly is a movement? And here's a definition of a movement. A movement elevates and empowers people to unite a community around a common cause, passion, company, brand, or organization. But to take it a little bit further, a sustainable movement happens when your customers, your employees, share their passion for a business or cause, and they become a self-perpetuating force for excitement, ideas, communication, and growth. Let's look at campaigns versus movements. And this makes it a little bit clearer. Campaigns have a start and a finish. Movements go on as long as kindred spirits are involved. Campaigns, and I found this really interesting about us marketing people. We love to use war words like target customers, penetrate markets, launch an attack on the competitors. And really, movements use these kind of words. Grassroots, inspiration, passion, loud and proud, and oh my goodness, my favorite word that should be used more often in the corporate world, and that is love. Campaigns are boring. Movements are full of excitement and passion. Campaigns use traditional medium. In movements, people are the medium. Campaigns are sort of us against them. Movements are we are in all in this together, holding hands. Campaigns are the creationist theory. We go behind a curtain, we create something, and ta-da, we announce it to the world. Well, a movement is more of an evolutionist theory. We gain ideas and momentum as time goes on. As more people join our forces, more momentum uh, is, is gained. Campaigns are like a light switch. There's an on and an off. Movements, on the other hand, are like a, a dial, a volume dial. We call it a passion dial. It's always on. It's always humming. It's always at one. But you have the ability to juice it up and get it really going past 10, maybe even 11. So here's my first uh, lesson There's, uh, out of the 10 that we have in the book that I really, really love to focus on because I think it really is important. And it's a simplistic thought, but it's really a, an important one. Movements are about the passion conversation, not the product conversation. One of the best examples that we have that we love to share is with our friends at Fist Cars. I don't know how many of you actually have had a pair of orange handled scissors, but chances are you do somewhere in your office or your home, you have something made by Fiskars. Fiskars is a beautiful company that was founded in Helsinki, Finland. They're 360-something years old. They um, are actually the second oldest corporation in the world. Um, and when we work, started working with them six or seven years ago, they had done some research, some traditional research, you know, the kind where you ask if you're a beverage, what are you? If you're a food, what are you? And they found out that if they were a beverage, they were milk. If they were a food, they were saltine crackers. And this has been exactly, you know, great news from from a, a branding standpoint. Um, but the good news is everybody does have it. Kind of like everyone has some sort of Fiskars tool. It's just that we don't get out and we don't go out in the morning and go, oh, my God, I had the most be the best milk. And if we did, chances are we don't mention it by name. We just don't think about those names. So we went out into the into the uh, blogosphere and we started. We did some my, uh, conversation mining with a company out of Colorado called Umbria at the time. It's now part of JD Powers. And we started listening. What did we hear? And we found that virtually there was virtually no conversation about the scars in the blogosphere. And that existing hubs had really become a, ca a place for cattiness and criticism. You know, if you put your your, your kid's picture out there, somebody might say, oh, my gosh, that layout's ugly, and your kid's ears are huge. I mean, was, in fact, they even laugh, and they call themselves online the scrap bitches. We also felt like um, we had discovered through linguistic studying that they did that, that this was a much younger crowd out there talking, that there were Gen X and Gen Y, that scrapbookers isn't just for grandmothers anymore. We also believe that movements start with the very first conversation. And this is a woman that we reached out early on. Remember, this is evolutionist theory now. It's not the creationist. We're reaching out to people who can help us, sharing our ideas on how to get this thing started. At the time, this, the how of what we were trying to get started is to find some brand ambassadors for the brand. And we started talking to um, this woman. Her name is Donna Dallin. She's like, oh, I love them. And she was a very influential scrapbooker, blogger, online in the online space.
she could uh, go out and say she loves something and 85 people would instantaneously go something back to her. So she had a lot of influence and she helped us really shape this program. And I tell you that because I, I think a lot of people get caught up in finding the influencers in the space, but as you'll see, we, we, are, we are big believers in finding the most passionate people and making, making them influential. So that's just what we did. We put up recruitment posters that we're looking for for as far as brand ambassadors. That's just what we're looking for. We're recruiting them. We went to four different cities that we had picked. In 11 days, we did over 120 face-to-face -face interviews where women just sat and talked about their lives. We participated in their lives. And we really started to understand the conversation that was going on. And we felt there was an opportunity to reframe that conversation. Because these women were extremely passionate, but they were not passionate about the tools. They were passionate about what those tools enabled them to do. Things like this, like share the stories of their lives, the babies being born, or just a bad haircut. I mean, this is just their everyday lives. So let's, we said, let's reframe the conversation from being about scissors to about people celebrating their creativity and sharing their personal lives with each other. And, you know, it, we wanted it to be a community led not by the best technical scrapbookers, but by the, the, the most passionate, because influence, as I said, can be made in this digital age. The passion team. It. So we picked these four women. They were from very diverse backgrounds. One was uh, our original leads. This was we've had. Uh, this is our third set of leads. They have a two-year tenure. We believe that movements have leadership. If no one is expected to lead the movement, no one will lead the movement. So these women were from all walks of life: stay-at-home moms, teachers, uh, police officers, uh, scrapbook store owners. They, they had very, very different kinds of lives and were very different technically skilled. We brought them to Mecca, which in this case is corporate headquarters for Fiskars in Madison, Wisconsin, and we openly shared with them. We gave them training, taught them how to blog, taught them how to, how to communicate, how to be transparent and tell people, and told them, you know, gave them permission to not just talk about Fiskars and Fiskars products, but to talk about their lives. If the kid throws up in the back seat, Talk about that because this is what real conversation, real word of mouth really is about. It's not about product features. We created an invite-only website that they helped us design. Um, this is the first iteration of that website. You actually had to reach out to one of the leads. Their bios were on there. And if you connected with them and you said, hey, I want to be a, a part of this, they would reach back out to you in 24 hours and say, awesome. That's great, you're in. They very seldom excluded anybody, but this allowed a real personal, deep one-on-one -on -one conversation to initially take place, and we believe it's the reason for such extreme uh, uh, engagement on this on their Fiskars site. Um, and and they, they did become friends. They became terribly engaged with movements with both online and offline. That's another one of our lessons. And we had an awful lot of offline events. We brought them to San Antonio, Texas. We brought 50 of the most active community members. We brought them there where they bonded and shared, and it was just phenomenal. So the key takeaway here, what are your customers really talking about? I mean, ask yourself, what are they really talking about? People don't in real life stand around and talk about product features. They just don't. They talk about their lives. How do you fit into their lives? This is just really critical and really important to go out and understand. And also, how can you find your organization's best friends? You know, even embrace the nut nuts, the people that, that are fanatic about you. How do you do that? Okay, I'm going to jump to my next lesson that I love, which is lesson number seven, and movements have powerful identities. This is a statement I love and we often ask ourselves. Fill in the blanks. I am a blank. I am an Obama mama. I am a Democrat. I am a this. I'm a that. Whatever you might be, we tend to identify with those I things, things that are part of our identity. Well, the Fisketeers, with our help, we created an identity for the community called the Fisketeers. Again, it's an I am word. And the look and feel of this, while Brains on Fire has world-class designers, um, we really wanted it to be something achievable and as if the team had been a part of it. So this is very much a look and feel that a scrapbooker could attain. Because 90% of word of mouth happens offline, we created an engaging um, tool to give to people, to again become part of that identity. The special scissors were sent to you actually 
with your own number on it. This is number 360. And it was mailed to you as a surprise and delight offline tool that you could take to a scrapbooking session with your friends. But people might ask you, you might can notice on your monitor that this is orange and green, which is kind of unusual. You're used to seeing orange color scissors, but it's disruptive to see orange and green. And this in itself becomes a conversation tool for spreading the word offline. So this is important to offline. And in fact, the Fiskars, the Fisketeers themselves created their own marketing tools. This is Fisketeer number three. She's showing off and surprising the community with her license pad. This is Fisketeer number 5140 Jane. She's an OBGYN in Los Angeles. And she's probably wearing it at a, at a crafting type party where she's also wearing the colors of the fish colors brand. This is another one of my favorite sayings. It's in the book. Your company is the story that people tell about it. And this is a great example of story and how story can ignite powerful identities that people connect to and therefore create a movement. This is a company called Justice for Children International, and they came to Brains on Fire about three years ago with a problem. There was another uh, not-for-profit called Justice for Children that was based out of Texas, and they had a conflict going there. There was confusion in the market space because their name was the same. So they came to us really with a naming issue, which, as I told you, that is the roots of Brains on Fire. We were naming an identity company and have since moved into the movement building business and just used our skills there. But when they came to us, they said we had this naming problem. And Rob Morris, that's him. <laughs> He's got his eyes closed. But um, I wish I had the video to share with you. Please go see it. I'd love, uh, I'll give you their website for that in just a minute after I tell the story. But Rob came to us, and he, he his focus, he has teammates with him, about two or three of them. Their single-minded focus is to abolish child sex slavery and exploitation in the world. It's a pretty big task. And when they came to us, um, Rob told this amazing story about how he and his colleagues had gone to Southeast Asia and literally posed as the, the, the people that they were fighting against as they went into a brothel to understand how this all works and how it works. And I never knew this. I, I was literally sitting in our conference room, and he was telling the story about how it works. Is, you know, these men walk in, and there's these little girls behind a pane of glass. And in this particular case, they were all dressed in red. And it had the very dignity of a name stripped from them. And on, instead, they had numbers, um, you know, handwritten numbers tagged to them so that you could pick them out by number. And they were young and, uh, and scared. And, and most of them kind of devoid of a life that a child has in their eyes, except for one little girl who kept looking out at the men. Uh, she was not watching the television that was all flickering in the corner. And this one little girl, Rod told her, she said, I'll never know her name, but I'll never forget her face. She still had fight left in her. She still had life left in her. And she was looking at us with that childlike, help me life. And I'll never forget her number. It was 146. And so in her story, in her story, we found their name and in, and in fact created quite a groundswell of support of people like me that are doing what I'm doing right now, that are out telling her story. And that, that organization was, proud, you know, courageously renamed love146.org. They we've created badges that look like this. I, I put mine on my book bag. I travel a lot. People see this in airports. They ask me, what does that mean? And her story is told. So this becomes a pass onable tool but, you know, you can call it marketing, but it's way more useful than a brochure. It's way more useful. It becomes a tool that ignites a conversation, which gets people to go. And there's the website, love146.org. Please check out Rob's stories directly from him. Look at the videos. This is a group called Paramore. They um, did some of the background music on the popular movies Twilight and also often on the MTV Video Music Awards. And they wear the patch, and they tell her story to thousands of people every time they play. So there's a, just a groundswell of support for her and retelling this story so that we can have an impact on this organization who is building safe homes in wonderful places. And it's, if you go to Etsy, people are doing their own marketing and making donations, just one-off, uh, creating things, selling them, and donating the profits. This is a, a young girl who did 146 Days of Love. Just beautiful story after story. This is a pastor in Long Island, New York. He was given an anonymous uh, lottery ticket, $3 million, and he gave the first installation to Love 146. 
and he also got on the on the Good Morning America early show, and he told millions about it. So again, her story is told. Um, it's just one of the most powerful examples, I think, of a powerful identity, and I love to tell that story. There's another simple example, but I'm going to share it with you. It's about um, a small uh, uh, city, a historic city, one of our most historic cities in the United States called Charleston, South Carolina. And we were approached by uh, a group in Charleston who had started a private public uh, foundation called the Charleston Parks Conservancy to help Charleston protect its 120 parks in the same way that they look after their architecture and their history. And so we renamed that. But we said, you know, the bigger opportunity is not just to create a new organization. And the organization was modeled very much after the New York Park, Central Parks Conservancy. But here's the real opportunity to create a band of passionate people who will actually come out and give time to the parks, the, the Charleston Park Angels. Again, I am a Charleston Park Angel. And that's exactly what people say. And you hear it over and over again in the city as people begin to take pride in identifying with, with this movement. Because a movement is not a spasm of passion. It's a collective shout that people are able to say, I'm a part of that. I'm a part of something bigger. So what are the stories that your company tells? Really deep, deep, because sometimes I think as companies, we overlook them. We've heard them so much, we forget how critical they are. I mean, when Rob told me that story, which I guess he told a million times, I had a physical reaction to that story, literally my whole body. It, it shifted everything for me that day. So how can you unite, celebrate, and amplify a community? That's another question that you really need to ask yourself, because if you don't have a genuine community, and I'm not just talking an online community where people sign up and forget their password the next day. You don't have a genuine sense of community surrounding your company, brand, or organization. You want, if not a movement. And movements do get results. This is lesson number 10. I think I remember there were no online mentions within a matter of 12 months. There was a 600% increase in online mentions. There were mentions, I say almost zero, but there were in the world of millions and millions of conversations. We now have over 120,000 positive comments out there mentioning the scars by name, which is pretty phenomenal. We've seen three times sales growth in stores visited by lead piscateers. We now have over 8,000 engaged members of the community. And, and this part did a yearly ROI community value. In other words, they, they looked at the things they didn't have to do anymore because of this community, and they saw a 500% yearly value of this community. Love 146 has over doubled has more than doubled donations since changing their name and their story, and they're now sponsored by people like GQ Magazine and Bon and Mercier. They've been lots of momentum and done lots of hard work with the help of their uh, evangelists and tender spirits. And the Park Angels, the same thing. It's largely offline. People are literally giving up their weekends to work on the parks, um, but it's been a phenomenal thing. And they, they're creating their own ideas and sharing their passion for the parks. I love this. Every single day of my life, this is from a Tuscateer, I say the word Tuscateer to someone every single day. Isn't that what we all want for our brands? Don't we want other people out there talking about us rather than us doing the push every day? And my favorite sense of measurement, and I love this, I didn't get to share the work we've done with the teen anti-tobacco movement here in South Carolina, which has gained international recognition for its peer-to-peer conversation. But I love this. This is from Chris Ivan, who was one of the original wage teenagers. Uh, nine years ago, when I interviewed him for the book, he said, Robin, I think it got stuck in our hearts. And isn't that where we want our brand or our organization or our cause to sit in someone's heart? So I leave you with that, and, and, and I'm going to wrap up. I went kind of fast there, so I could leave plenty of time for um, you to ask us questions. I'll say, though, before I, I end, so please follow me, join me, join the conversation, and join our movement at Brains on Fire. Um, you can join us at, at Brains on Fire on Twitter or me personally, Robin, that's with two Bs, so up. And um, you can reach out to me by email, too, if you remember those two Bs. It's pretty easy, Robin, at BrainsOnFire.com, and I, I'd love hearing from you guys. So there I am. Ask away. I, I think I, I need to send the desktop back over to you, or do I need to do something there, Sal? Uh, let me try and hold it. try to take it back right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Robin. That was uh, that was really great. Um, that was um, that was a really great presentation. And as you mentioned, we're going to go ahead and take some questions 
Uh, please submit your questions to um, to Twitter if possible, Pound Sign Awareness Inc. You can also submit your questions in the WebEx chat. I just want to go over a couple more housekeeping items, then I promise we're going to fill the rest of the hour up with questions. Um, so if you enjoyed today's session uh, from awareness, uh, there are a couple of little follow-up items that you can do. You know, please join our fan page. Our fan page on Facebook is Social Media Marketing Best Practices. Um, we, do, we do a lot of great discussions and um, information dis dissemination on that page. Please follow us on Twitter, uh, Awareness Inc., at Awareness Inc., um, and same thing for mirrors the Facebook page. Also, um, please do follow our blogs. Uh, we have a lot of people blogging about not only our product, but just, um, you know, our industry in general. Um, and then I just want to uh, remind everyone that we do have another presentation coming up. It's actually not necessarily at the title, but on uh, March 17th, our next webinar is uh, – Consumer Conversations and Curation with Steve Rosenbaum, who's done a lot of uh, sort of video work with NTV. He's an author, entrepreneur, filmmaker, digital curator. Uh, again, that's 2 p.m. and that's free. Um, so please join us on March 17th. And with that, I'm going to try to get into some questions. Please submit them on Twitter. Hashtag is uh, hashtag Awareness Inc. But Robin, one question that I do have ready right now is. Um, one thing you mentioned is, uh, as part of your definition of a movement, is that the employees have to sort of share passion in the, you know, in the same way that you're trying to elicit passion out of your audience. Um, in the case where, you know, that isn't the case, are you taking steps to make sure that the employees, you know, have that same passion? If so, what are those steps, or is it sort of something that needs to be addressed in the hiring phase? You know, I think that's really a, a great question. Um, you know, a lot of companies are approaching us, and we're actually working with a couple of companies right now to, to build internal movements, you know, to really sort of get people to understand why they're there in the first place, who they are, what they stand for, so that they can go out there. I mean, in, in this first case, it's pretty obvious the people that go to work there typically are people who care about what the pro about the products they're selling. It's, it's really a great place for them to work. But what do you do when you get to some place where you're selling, uh, you know, I don't know, phones or whatever? Is that your true passion? You know, but I, I think I think that's where you have to dig deep and say, what is the passion conversation? What is it that we really, really stand for? It's almost a game I play with myself now when I talk to people and I'm listening. And I think it's, it, I think everybody has it. Every company has it. Whether it's making people's lives simpler, easier, better. Um, you know, there there is something there that people get up every morning to do. I mean, we all want to be, as we said, a part of a bigger story. Sometimes it's just bringing it front and center. Okay. Um, Sorry, so that, okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think it did. Um, so one question um, I, about this stars in general uh, that just came up on Twitter. How much knowledge is needed to get a movement like this start? Star, online knowledge. Sorry, let me re restart. How much online knowledge is needed to get a movement like this car started, or do you provide a lot of training? Well, you know, we do provide training. Part of what what we do is we develop a unique curriculum for every every uh, company that we start working for. And it's usually a two-day pretty intensive sharing. It's not only to help them um, find their voice and their passion and their, their, their why they want to do this. Uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of that, but it's also some technical training: how to blog, how to do this, how to how to you know how to think like this, and how how, how most of all to be real honest and, and transparent, and, and to, to never ever you know answer anything that isn't truthful and. Um, you know, to not be out there shilling product. I mean, that's not the point. The point is to be out there sharing your passion so that you unite others, and it's strictly supported by this bars. In other words, it's a much different mentality. You know, there's so many people that don't realize that, that this is a conversation we should be supporting. This is something we could and possibly be supporting, and you get credit for that by doing it. You don't have to push products at that point because you, you get this group of people who love you for helping them have a hub, a place for their passions. And was there any difficulty in getting and convincing Fistar to sort of trust the non-employees uh, to speak on behalf of their brand? Yeah, you know, not, not, no, no. And I think part of it, it does fall down to trust. I mean, I think people have different levels of that. We've seen it over time, um, you know, with different organizations. And, you know, at some point, the, what, what, I love what, uh, Jay from Discourse, he's a CMO there, he, he actually said, you know, people are going to talk about you anyway. 
wouldn't you rather know about it? Had the chicken react to it? Had the chicken really have a relationship with these people who are out there talking about you? That's what it really boils down to. We, we, we you know, we can't, we can't control anybody <laughs> anymore. You know, there is no control anymore. And I think we all know that on a certain level. It's just really hard. It's hard, harder for some companies to let go than others. I think it feels more natural to others, and it felt natural to this place. So um, one question that just came up over the chat from um, from Warwick is um, any examples of B2B companies that are sort of engaging in this uh, movement um, mentality? You know, we have a lot of people reaching out to us, and, and you, you are not the first person to ask that. And this may sound kind of crazy, but we are big believers in practicing what we preach. It is what Brains on Fire has done. And Brains on Fire is located in Greenville, South Carolina, for goodness sakes, and yet we are asked to speak all over the world. We have literally collected kindred spirits and supporters. I, I spend most of my day talking to and relating to people who, who want to do what we do, who want to take what we're doing forward. And, and I think that's great because I personally believe we're all in marketing grad school. And we have applied an awful lot of principles of loving the people who love you, and they will love you back. And we've applied a lot of those principles to the work that we do. We have something here where we have an offline event called the Fire Session. We invite potential clients, kindred spirits, just people who love us, to come for a day and a half of sharing and um, participating and learning with each other. And that creates real strong bonds, bonds where Honestly, I have people out there who literally have become almost a volunteer sales force for Brains on Fire. And it's fascinating and, and awesome, and uh, especially for somebody like me that doesn't like to make a, a cold call. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, that word just sends chills on my back. So I, I would much rather have people, you know, reach out to us to determine fit than we have to do the opposite. It's just, it's just much more fun. So to say that we have, you know, great examples of that now, we really don't. I, I think um, at this point uh, we've worked with some beautiful foundations and some uh, consumer products, uh, but we really haven't done it quite yet B2B. Okay. Um, I noticed uh, that you did sort of you, you had statistics to back up the effectiveness, um, but without sort of seeing the you know the initial stats, you know, it's hard to tell. There's a couple questions coming in here, sort of about you know does action have an ROI? How exactly did you measure these results? Does passion have an ROI? How exactly do we measure results? Is that what you're saying? Um, you know, one of the first things that we do is, um, you know, we define success. What is success? In this first case, they wanted more online mentions, but we got that. I mean, it was really pretty simple. We said, what is success, and how are we going to measure it six months, 12 months, three years down the road? And it changes. It evolves. And we, we may make those things very different. Um, you know, I think that... In this world, we all have a responsibility in this social media world, and you said it yourself, Sal, we have a responsibility to first define what success is going to be, and success is ultimately more sales. And I will tell you, that is, that is true for the companies, a, a lot of the companies that we've worked with, there are, you know, they're seeing sales increase. But one of the things that is sort of the surprise benefit is just this sort of complete cultural change. I mean, when we first met this cars, they literally had an R&D department that was very secretive because their products were being knocked off a couple of days after being in the market. And now that's just completely gone. They're very transparent. They, the the R&D folks call themselves the fifth in years. Thirteen different product ideas a month are developed by the fifth of years. They are better. They are fueling a better product because of their involvement with the fifth of years. And, you know, I, I believe that is the power of this little thing that we're all trying to study, this little shiny ball called social media. I think it's the power is that, you know, it has this ability to create total positive cultural shift. I saw that as an ROI statement from um, a company who had entered the WOMI Awards, which is WOMA, the World Mouth Marketing Association Awards, and I was judging them, and I that fell out of my seat. I said, that's it, bingo. We, we really are touching every single department with our ability to connect and unite the passions of our customers and to create stronger bonds. I mean, statistics prove that the, the, num the sheer volume of people that you have closer con – that have – okay, the sheer volume of employees that have close contact to your customers, the more innovative a company is. And we know that the more innovative a company is, the more profitable and the more the more they grow. I mean that's just that's proven. There's been studies about it. And 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 I think that's really exciting because again, 
product innovation is something that, you know, we just can't live without, whether we're a service industry, B2B, or whether, I mean, we can't, and I don't know a company on the planet that can't live without innovation. So especially in this very fast-paced world, everything changes every single day, and, and, and you have to move with it, and you have to do it organically and freely. And being closer to your customers, we all know it. You just know it from life. The closer you are to your customers, the more you attend you are to their needs, and the chances are that you're going to feel better products. So to me, that's the, the ultimate ROI, and we ought to be finding out ways to concretely measure it. It's our responsibility as marketing grad school, school students to, to really document that. So that's my answer. Oh, yeah, that's a great answer. I mean, you know, goal setting is, uh, is obviously should be a part of every marketing initiative. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this should be no different. And some of the examples that you gave about, you know, what goals are set, they, you know, it doesn't seem like it's something that's all that difficult to sort of come up with some ideas on how you're going to measure your success. Um, one, um, a lot of questions are sort of coming in along the lines of um, each of the examples that you have sort of had an offline component. So are you saying that sort of this – Igniting a word of mouth movement like this is, is an offline component a requirement, or for say in the case of a smaller company or limited resources, can they do you know all of their work online? Um, you know, honestly, I we really believe that offline component is, is very very important. And I showed two different examples of offline. Events are an offline getting together face to face. I mean, you know, that is important. We do believe that really do. But there's other ways to have an offline engagement. You know, we sent those scissors out. Well, the scissors create an offline engagement because you get something that you weren't expecting. It's remarkable. It's numbered and you are special and you go tell somebody. Maybe you tell 10 people. I mean, you know, the process of recruiting is actually offline too. You tell your friends and family. So there, you know, there's more than one way to just be I think what 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 is, is sad to me is the sheer number of companies that think that they can say, okay, we have a community, it's online, it's up and running, join us, let's get, or a Facebook page. I mean, this is the other thing that we're really working with right now with a lot of clients because Facebook is a big part of our lives. It's fitting into our lives. We've all got to figure out how this works. But, you know, is is number of Facebook fans mean anything? Should you pay a dollar for a fan? Does it have a dollar value to it? I mean, I, I'm, I'm struggling with it. And, and I ask anybody out there that's got great answers to, to join this conversation because I would rather have 500 people who talk to me every day than the millions of people who click me once. I mean, I really would. I mean, I would. I think they're more valuable. And so I think it's, it's a, the deeper, more emotionally connected that you are to your customers, the better off you are. So well, I think I answered your question, but I got lost in what the question was. <laughs> so. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with your your comment on a Facebook page. Um, you know, because at a very simple level, you can go out there and pay for fans. There's a lot. There's a lot of things you can do to, to boost the number of fans of your Facebook page. But you know, what we do here at Awareness is we want engaged fans, and you know, we think we do a pretty good job. Um, you know, we have a, a, a pretty good amount of people following us, but every time we post something, we manage to get a, a good number of likes and conversations and things like that. It's not a stagnant page. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think, you know, e even in the realm of social media, um, there's metrics that sort of, you know, you should be using beyond number of fans to judge the success of, of that initiative along with any other initiative that you, that you may have. Um, so uh, another good question that, that came up, uh, this one is via Twitter. Um, you mentioned this sort of early on in your presentation, and it seems like a no-brainer, but sometimes when you get into a boardroom, it's not necessarily as easy as it sounds. How do you convince a brand to stop talking about its products and instead talk about how they're used? Because, you know, I have personally been in situations where there is sort of pushback to, the, to that idea. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that one of the really important questions is, um, you know, social media is, is about, word of mouth. I mean, we're talking to each other. We're talking to each other. Human beings, real lives, human beings with hopes and dreams and pet peeves and annoyances. And I've yet to met a human being who come up to me and said, did you know that the new da 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 something 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 has a something 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 feature on it? And and it just, you don't do that. Or do you know that the, the curve of the, you know, the diameter of the so-and-so is made this way more 
more controllable and accessible. I mean, we don't talk about products, features, and benefits. We talk about, oh, my gosh, I found this scissor, and you won't believe what it did. You can make these little round doozy things now. And did you see what I did with this? I made the most beautiful coach, and look what I did. I made these party invites. Or, you know, I mean, I think we've just got to be realistic about what people really talk about if we really are sincere as brands and companies and organizations about joining the conversation. And and I think I think – we just have to ask ourselves, what do we hear in our own lives? And and those are the those are that's a really hard thing to face because people yes, I do love my new Mac laptop. But I, I love the fact that I'm I'm an Apple user. I saw that question on there. It kind of defines who I am. It's part of my identity. I am. And I'm a Mac person. You know, it, it defines my, me by the by saying I'm creative. Uh it's like a car that I drive now. So it's like the mini, you know. It's it's making a statement, and it it is a it is got some. It is a remarkable product, no denying. Remarkable. You can't sell a, a crappy product through, you know, supporting a person's passion conversation around if the product is crappy. Best cars make beautiful products. I mean, that cannot be ignored, and and that is big big piece of things. So, you know, you you have to get people to to be realistic about, uh, you know, what it is that that they're clients and customers are really talking about and how you fit in their lives. It's a social role now. It's not a product role. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, our, that's, that's great advice. So, you know, if I could just sort of summarize what you're saying, you know, if, if you are getting pushback, um, in, you know, in this area where someone says they should be talking about, you know, the product rather than, than the passion about the product, try to make them somehow see a realistic conversation that a potential customer or client, you know, is having about whatever you offer. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking, I was talking to a friend of mine, and he has, um, he had started when he first had a, a child, maybe you guys have heard of him, he's called Hugh Weber, he's online all the time, he had this thing called Dude to Dad, and um, when he first found out that he was having a baby, he went online and he started blogging about it, he started talking about this experience of, oh my gosh, I'm just going from being a regular dude to a dad. And I would say, and that's awesome, you know, I, I could see a product, many products that could support that lifestyle, someone who's just been thrown into the dude to dad world. And there was tons of followers that he had immediately. Obviously, there was lots of guys wanting to talk about this subject, how do I go from being a guy and doing guy things to being a dad and really being a good one. And there are lots of products that could join that conversation, that could support that conversation. So when you come at it from the other side, you start to see these other things as well. Um, You know, there's, you know, we're we're doing, we do a lot of work for -for not-for-profits. We're doing some work for the National uh, Center for Family Literacy. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, when you say family literacy, you found out that you know, there's not a lot of people talking about literacy. When you think literacy, you think people who can't read. But what it really means to them is to really promote learning, everyday learning, everywhere, all the time, within the family, within the schools. You know, what are the learning opportunities to really en- enhance our children's lives and our, our families' lives, quite frankly. And um, so we're creating, uh, along with our partners at the, at, the, at the National Center for Family Literacy, a site called Wonderopolis.org, and it's a wonder of a day. And it really is just remarkable stuff that you want to talk about. The content is remarkable things, like, you know, why are school buses yellow? Just really intriguing questions. You know, pick a spot with your family and make it your spot and go visit it at different times of day and see how it looks different, feels different. Ideas to be a family. Ideas just to be creative and to think and be engaged with the world, which is learning. Engagement equals learning. It's not just all about reading. It is about reading and going and, and doing some wonderful things, but, but it's also about being truly engaged with your world and, and helping families do that with ideas and suggestions in their business lives. So, you know, that, that is also a way for an organization to create content that then becomes conversation. So I, I like that example as well. Great, great. Yeah. Um, we're just about out of time, so I, Robin, I'd like to, you know, thank you. I thought this was a great webinar. It's, uh, you know, definitely information that I hadn't heard before. Uh, I love these examples, but, you know, I recommend to our, all our uh, attendees out there, find the book, find it on Amazon. When we send out the, um, when we send out the follow-up email to the webinar, we'll, we'll include the link on where you can find the book. Um, again, we only went over a couple of the lessons, so there's plenty of the book to go over, um, you know, that we didn't touch on. So, uh, thank you, Robin. Um, thank you, Robin, for having a very informative, uh, webinar. 
all our attendees. Thank you for attending, and um, we will see everybody on March 17th. Great. And I'll just say one more thing. I see a lot of questions on Twitter. I'll try to answer them. I'm jumping on a plane right now, so it probably would be a little while, but I'll try to, I'll try to get back to some of them. I appreciate you, you um, reaching out to me and, and hopefully following me, and I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Sal. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.